Welcome to the 58th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Devika Girish. I'm the assistant editor at Film Comment and Film at Lincoln Center. And I'm one of the programmers of the festival's talk section along with Madeline Whittle. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very exciting conversation. We have some amazing guests with us today. You can see them on screen. Uh, we'll get to them in just a second, but I just want to make some remarks first and say some thank yous. The New York Film Festival has always been about bringing community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us in our virtual cinema or at one of our drive-in venues, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you for being a part of this historic edition. Thank you to the FLC board, patrons, members, and dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. As a nonprofit, we rely on your support, and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers, take advantage of discounts and special offers, while helping us to continue sharing the best in cinema. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today. We are also very grateful to our tireless staff and volunteers who are working behind the scenes to make this festival possible. In addition to screenings, you can access the New York Film Festival from anywhere with our vir free virtual talk series taking place throughout the festival. Do subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast for Q&As with filmmakers, including the ones uh, you're going to talk to today, uh, panel discussions, and much more. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss any exciting updates or festival announcements. And join the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not the least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, including HBO, who is the presenting partner of all Film at Lincoln Center talks. Now coming to today's discussion, just to uh, give everyone a little bit of context for uh, this panel, which is titled Rethinking Wolf Cinema. Uh, you know, the New York Film Festival has always been a really international festival, but this year in particular, we have films by trailblazing directors um, that are sort of exceptional in various ways, not just, of course, in quality uh, and form, but also in the way that they are redefining or challenging our understandings of wolf cinema, uh, which of course itself is a strange label because wolf cinema means different things based on where you're in the world, which is something we'll dig into. Uh, and so we're very happy to have these filmmakers join us today. Um, I'll introduce them one by one and as I take your name, it would be great if you told us where you're joining us from, where in the world you're joining us from, just uh, in the theme of the discussion. So we have Dea Kulumbigashvili, whose first feature, Beginning, is in the festival's main slate. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm, thank you. <laughs> I'm joining from here. We have Chaitanya Tamhani, whose The Disciple is also in the main slate. Hi, I'm joining from Mumbai. Uh, we have Philip Lacote, uh, whose film Night of the Kings is also in the main slate. Hello, uh, thanks for this meeting. I'm joining from uh, Paris. And we have Nicholas Elliott, who is the interpreter for Philip today, and he'll be around to uh, assist him. And finally, we have Olivier Marbeuf and Louis Henderson, who are members of the Living and the Dead Ensemble, the collective behind the film Overtures, which is in our current section. Yeah, hi, hello, I'm joining from Rennes in the west of France, closer to the sea than my colleague. Yeah, I'm joining from uh, Berlin. Hello. Thank you all for uh, making time and uh, helping us figure out, figure, figure out a mutually agreeable time zone, which, uh, you know, has been a task for these talks, but it also means that we can have these unique conversations that span the globe and bring together people that, you know, otherwise uh, may not be able to attend our talks or, or participate in them. So thank you so much. And before I go into the discussion, I just want to let everyone know that we will have some time at the end of the discussion for audience questions. You can see the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar. Uh, feel free to submit questions there throughout the discussion. And at the end, I'll select uh, a few to read out to our panelists. Um, so I'd like to actually start with the, you know, with what is sort of exceptional about each of your films and what, how that kind of makes us grapple with the idea of national cinemas and world cinemas, especially in the film festival context. So 
Chaitanya, maybe we could start with you here. Um, your film, The Disciple, is the first film from India to be in the New York Film Festival main slate in 24 years. I think uh, it, of course, won a Fibreski Prize at Venice, and it was also the first film in about two decades to play in competition at one of the major European festivals which is a great commendation to your work as a director, of course, uh, but it's also a strange thing given what a robust film culture India has and how many films it produces every year. And I'm curious to hear your experience of making these films in India and then taking them uh, through the International Film Festival circuit. What have you learned from that? Right, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a kind of a milestone for independent Indian cinema in a way, because like you said, you know, in Venice, it was after 20 years in New York, it's after 24 years and it feels great. And, uh, you know, uh, we feel honored, but at the same time, it does raise the question, like what happened in those 24 years or what happened in those 20 years? Like where does that uh, gap kind of lie? Because we are making more films than any other country in the world and Indian cinema is not just Bollywood. There's a very robust independent, uh, you know, filmmaking culture in the country. So the question is, is there, uh, you know, mm, a, a lack of attention or a kind of a lack of acknowledgement from these film festivals uh, when it comes to like something like the main competition or the main slate, or is it because the films are not good enough, you know, which could have its own reasons like, uh, film being a capital intensive medium and not having, uh, you know, funding from institutions or state patronage or resources. Uh, so it's a real question, you know, uh, and one does not make films for film festival, you, you know, one makes a film and then hopes for an audience. It's again kind of sad in a way that we need to get a claim from the so-called West and from you know international film festivals before people back home take notice or, or, or realize that okay this is something worth uh, you know paying attention to or worth watching so yeah there are these questions and i don't know what i've learned because uh, both my films i didn't make them for the film festivals but yes we've been lucky enough to have had you know the films premiere at venice and then have uh, you know fairly successful international festival runs and uh, you know at the same time these films are rooted in such a specific cultural context that you also want people back home uh, to to watch these films. So yeah, I, I in short, after having said all of this, I don't have the answer to this question, you know, because for me, all cinema is like, uh, you know, universal in a way, like it's, uh, like you said, the, the, the term, what is world cinema is, is very ambiguous, you know. Hmm. And Dea, maybe uh, you can chime in here. Uh, as I was telling you before we went live, we realized that your film is the first feature from Georgia to ever play in the New York Film Festival in history. Um, and you also made history with your short film Lethe, which I believe was the first film from independent Georgia to be in the Khan lineup. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering also, you were educated, like you went to uh, film school in New York and you've spoken about that and growing up in Georgia being like two important influences in your filmmaking. And maybe you could speak to that journey and similar to Chaitanya, maybe reflect on, you know, um, what this whole process has taught you. Well, I, I was really surprised when I learned that my film was the, is the first Georgian film in New York Film Festival because Georgia has uh, incredible cinematic history of cinema and uh, I think that many people do love Georgian films or films made by Georgian directors not really knowing that those are films from Georgia and I guess like one of the biggest uh, probably in, like problems here was the Soviet Union because most of the people probably watched Georgian films but they thought it's just a Soviet film mm. and they did not know where exactly this is uh, come from. But for me, um, I cannot imagine myself making films anywhere other than Georgia. It's absolutely like necessary for me. And I think that this film in particular for me was in a way maybe my you know, journey home after I studied in New York and I lived in New York for a long time. And I think it was really profound and very important experience for me to live in New York because I could have some distance from my country. I could reflect 
and I could start to see what's the place of my country or what's the position of my country in the context of the, in a global context. But I do believe that uh, for me, cinema is uh, very, very personal. It should be personal in, in, in the first place. Because I think that only personal can then become something universal because it, we all do share our same stories as humans all around the world. And I think that with this film in particular, I can see that people do relate. Even though in the uh, financing process, there were so many questions because many people were doubting if uh, the audiences around the world could relate or could understand mm. the religious context of the film or the suffering of a woman or the place of a woman in the Georgian society. But again, like I live in New York and I know that this is not only particularly an issue which women are facing in Georgia, but I think it's something which is um, uh, really universally um, important and we're all facing it. It doesn't matter where we live. And I think the festivals just really show me that, that there is place for all cinema, and, and I agree that uh, you know, all, all cinema is cinema for me. I have never looked at cinema, okay, this is something from the East or this is something from the West. I do relate to the honesty and to the profound human experience. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll go to you now, Philip. Um, you know, I feel like I'm just reading a, a list of accomplishments for each of these films. But Philip, your film, Night of the Kings is the only the third ever Oscar submission by the Ivory Coast. And the previous one was also your film, uh, your uh, previous feature run. Um, yeah. And, you know, your film has also sort of represented sub-Saharan Africa in a lot of these festivals. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken about how it was an international co-production, but very specially, it's also a West African co-production between Senegal and Ivory Coast. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the process of producing the film, but also then representing, you know, kind of having to represent the region at these film festivals. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I, will, I will say that uh, for me, it's, uh, I'm very proud to represent uh, Ivory Coast and uh, West Africa in different festivals, because uh, maybe uh, Africa is a, less, is a continent with less represent in, in international festivals. Uh, there is uh, many reasons. Uh, first, we, we, we don't make a lot of films. Uh, and why we don't make a lot of films? We don't make a lot of films because uh, uh, we, we, didn't have a, we, we don't have an industry. Uh, for example, if I want to shoot in Ivory Coast, uh, people will think that it's very, it's very easy because uh, it's not expensive, it's a poor country and like this. But uh, there is no industry, so I, I need to bring everything. Uh, I need to bring two cameras, I, I, need to, I need to bring light, I need to bring everything because it's not possible to call, uh, to call a company and to say, okay, uh, I need this. I need this material today, and I will. I will. I will give back tomorrow. It's not possible. So we need to think uh, in a different way. Uh, and I will say that today uh, there is a lot of young director in Africa. There is a lot of uh, young director with talents, but it's not easy to understand exactly the system of co-production. It's not easy to 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 build. A co-production. If you if you live if you live in uh, uh, in Africa, uh, so all the directors you will see today from Africa uh, in in, in international festivals, they they don't live only in Africa. They are international. They travel. Me, I am between Paris and uh, and uh, Abidjan. Uh, it's the same thing for Mati Diop. It's the same thing for. Uh, 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 Alain Gomis, it's the same thing for, for Abderrahman Sisako. So uh, it's not easy today to make a, a feature film, a co-production, an international co-production, if you are from Africa. Um, and Louis and Olivier, your film is exceptional in a totally different way in that it's a transnational work of authorship um, the Living and the Dead Ensemble has members, if I'm uh, not wrong, from the UK, France, and Haiti. Yeah. 
-hmm. and it's a work of collective production. And the film itself is um, is kind of resurrecting, you know, the ghosts of Haiti's past in a very unusual uh, way through acts of translation, through acts of theater. Uh, I'm wondering if you could speak about, you know, how this ensemble came together and what the that experience of uh, making the film collectively and internationally was like. Uh, yeah, I will say something perhaps about the process of production, just to say something after Philip, what Philip said about mm -hmm. uh, the context of the African continent. So in a certain way, uh, Haiti is the, the most African island of the, Car of the Caribbean. It's really, really connected to Africa much more than yeah. other places. I'm coming yeah. from Guadeloupe, for instance, yeah. which is quite different than Haiti. And there is no industry at all in Haiti. So we are in the same kind of situation than Philippe, mm -hmm. that um, we have to bring all the material there. But we didn't try to produce a kind of film with a big industry. And I think the sense of what we try to do is a bit unusual to have uh, the production crew and everything to film much smaller than what we film. So the process of being in certain way overwhelmed by the reality, by the words, by the body, by the movement of the cities itself is in the center of the storytelling itself. So there is a kind of mix in between producing and writing and playing and performing the films. And there is not that idea of a kind of external uh, production of the film, the, the process of producing is also linked to the, um, the practice of performance and improvising some situations. So the writing was also writing with the group uh, on stage. So there is really that idea of not severing the idea. And mainly as we, we, we talk a lot about that with Louis, we are not the kind of people that decide to block, for, insta for, for instance, a street to shoot and say people don't move. No, we spend a lot of days in a street where we can finally shoot. Cause we need that agreement. We, the, we need that kind of agreement with the people around, the people of the ensemble, the actors, performers, but also the people around. It's really that really the idea to be in ecology where you can film. And if you can't, and some place in Port-au-Prince you can't film, so you don't, you don't block and you don't pay people with guns to film something. We're not here to extract a reality. We are here to perform something which is possible cause of a certain kind of uh, relationship and quality of relationship. That means that is a process of film that began with the first script of Louis in 2014, and we finished the film in 2019. So that means that. So it's really a kind of a political statement of how to produce in some contexts not to impose a certain kind of standard of production and not the violence also of trying to block everybody to produce a certain kind of reality about Haiti. Haiti is a super cinematic uh, place, like I think in India, like I think in the West Africa and on, uh, elsewhere. And so we just let it express itself through what we are doing. So it's not a direct film. It's a kind of invasion of the film <laughs> in the process of making that kind of film. I don't know, Louis, if you want to say something about the filming in that context. Yeah, I mean, I can just add that, um, you know, so Olivier and I have actually been working together for some time. We produced some short films together. This was our first feature film. Uh, I'm from England. Um, Olivier is from France and from Guadeloupe. So already, the f I, mean, I used to live in France for many years. I studied there. So us working together was already an international collaboration in some respects. But the films that we set out to make were f at that time very focused, I suppose, beginning really from a criticism of uh, Europe, I suppose. Both of us, or Olivier being part European and also part not European, me being European completely, but now no, no longer um, because of Brexit. And so the <laughs> of international uh, collaborations and ties is kind of strange. I had been making films, actually, I used to make films in England. And then I stopped for some time and started making films in countries that were not my own. Um, countries that I would visit and countries in which I didn't speak the language. You know, I made a film in Egypt, I made a film in Ghana, I made a film in the um, Dominican Republic, but I speak Spanish. But, you know, there was this always this problem of trying to make films that were some sort of critical 
inquiries into history of ethnographic cinema, history of documentary production made from the European continent in the African continent, for example, and trying to make a type of cinema that would, you know, think critically about the problems of power relations within a post-colonial context. But I felt that actually the films I was doing were actually still reproducing in subtle ways those kind of power dynamics. Um, so when we started to make overtures together, me and Olivier, the first conversation we had was, you know, how can we actually continue to make films uh, within these contexts, such as the Caribbean, for example, about a history of an anti-colonial revolution without reproducing the power struggles that have been taking place for years because of colonial domination from Europe. So with overtures, it was the first time that we actually said, you know, let's try and lose control, I think. I think that was the thing that we had both actually said from the outset. It wasn't like a clear decision, let's go to Haiti and lose control, but it was how do we relinquish our positions as authors who have the final say and the final argument about how an image is going to represent the history of a country that neither of us actually come from. This also meant a question then of spending a time in that country and learning the language. Both Olivier and I, I mean, Olivier speaks some Creole from Guadeloupe, uh, from his father, from his father's side of the family, but not Haitian Creole, which is different. It's a different Creole. Uh, so both of us went through the process of learning ha Haitian Creole. We didn't pay for lessons. We just spent time in Haiti with people learning the, the, the language. To be honest, I don't think there's that many filmmakers today that do that kind of practice, spend months and months in the country learning the language and then making connections um, in the place so you can actually then have, you know, a relationship that's based on collaboration. So for us, this international crossover was actually a sort of ethical and political position that then developed a um, aesthetic uh, sort of position or decision, let's say, which became this multi-authored work. So the film is directed by me and Olivier, but it's written and performed um, by a group of 10 people. And we, we, we developed the scenes and, you know, and the way in which that history would be represented through collective discussion. And we also translated a, a play that was written by Edouard Glissant, the Martinican philosopher and poet, uh, that he wrote about the history of the Haitian Revolution, and we translated it with this, the group of people from Haiti, um, from French into Haitian Creole. So actually for us, I think the whole process was very much related to language to, and to listening, spending enough time to listen to be able to learn a language, to then see how we can actually translate our positions in that place, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. And um, I definitely want to return to that question of language and translation uh, in a little bit, but I also wanted to ask all the panelists, um, what was your experience of cinema growing up and what did world cinema mean to you when you were, you know, just a young cinephile? Um, Dea, maybe you can start us off. I, I was not a young cinephile. I grew up uh, during World War and uh, honestly till I was uh, I turned 17 I think we never really had electricity so I did not watch films as a child so I was not a cinephile as a child but I guess like then when I did discover cinema it was like uh, really just this explosion uh, it was something which came into my life very late but it, it was like something really incredible and maybe just or maybe we'll talk about it later, about the language, actually, because I think that there are so many discussions about the, the language um, in which the, the film is made. And I always, like for me, for example, the Georgian language is uh, absolutely necessary to be part of my film. It's, it's, it's the soundscape of my film. And it's, I, I really can't imagine making a film in, in any other language, because uh, this is how I relate to the world also. But there are so many conversations always about in the financing process of the film, like how many of Georgians are out there who will watch this film. And it's really like not many of us, it's just four million <laughs> in the entire world. So I guess it's, um, 
but yeah, I was really not a cinephile, at least like, I can say that. So if, if I may just follow up and ask what were the, um, you know, when you did discover cinema, what were the early formative filmmakers or films that made you want to make cinema? Well, I, I think that the first, it was uh, maybe Italian neorealism, and then slowly I started to, like, I, I do remember watching this Sika, uh, and, like, I was just really, like, with my father, he would, we would watch the Sika together, and I was just, I could not believe that that kind of cinema could exist, because before that, maybe I watched a few Hollywood films as a teenager, but then when I came to New York, of course, I was watching a, a lot of movies, and, um, I think Chantal Ackerman or like, I guess like also like everybody talks about that after watching my film and I just want to say it out loud that obviously I am like greatly influenced by her work. Um, but I am as well influenced by Russian Soviet cinema or the French cinema and uh, I watch everything. Like now I watch maybe two or three films a day and uh, it's um, a great joy and everything influences me at a certain degree. Chaitanya, can you tell us about um, your experience growing up uh, and watching films? Right. Well, in India, it's hard not to be a cinephile <laughs> because you know, films are such an important part of our culture. But uh, as, a, as a child, I only grew up watching Bollywood films. That's the only kind of access I had. Even the Hollywood films, I couldn't watch because there were no subtitles and I couldn't catch the, the accent. So if they were the only way i could watch them if they were dubbed in hindi you know and that would happen quite a lot but otherwise it was just bollywood films and like they said for me it was a moment of explosion when i discovered what we call you know films from other parts of the world like world cinema and that happened at the age of around 18 or, or 17 and for me it was like a defining moment when i saw city of god the brazilian film that was like the first you know, foreign film that I'd seen outside of India and outside of Hollywood. And yeah, something went off in my head and I was completely obsessed, uh, you know, with films from other parts of the world. And it was like discovering a whole new world. It gave me like a sense of identity. Like I remember there was like a patch of about three years when somebody asked me, what do you do? I said, I watch films from around the world. That's what I do, you know. But yeah, I didn't have that, you know, privilege or luxury of, uh, of watching films from different parts of the world in the theater, uh, you know, growing up. And also what happened, uh, interestingly, at this age of around 18 or 19, a lot of DVD libraries popped up in Mumbai where you could rent films, you know, international films. So I was working in television and whatever I was earning, writing like shitty daily soaps at the age of 17 or 18, I would like use it to like rent DVDs. And it became a way for me to like, uh, you know, travel to different parts of the world and absorb stories from different cultures and that was also the time when I was like this is what I want to do I want to make films so that was my kind of uh, you know, journey with films which started relatively late uh, in, in a way and Philip what about you um, can you yes, tell I, us about I, your... uh, I will ask uh, Nicola to help me to translate yeah. something okay Nicola Oui, bon. ça marche. Euh, donc euh, voilà, je voulais dire que mon expérience à moi euh, en tant que cinéphile, elle a commencé très tôt parce que ma maison était collée à un cinéma, voilà, qui s'appelait le Magic à Abidjan. So I wanted to say that my experience as a cinéphile started very early because my house was right next to a cinéma in Abidjan called The Magic. Et, et ma mère, quand elle allait faire ses courses quotidiennes et qu'elle ne savait pas où me mettre, elle me mettait dans ce cinéma. Et donc, je restais 15-20 minutes, elle venait me rechercher, elle me remettait trois heures après, pendant 5 minutes, 10 minutes. Et donc, je ne voyais jamais un film en entier. So, whenever my mom would go shopping every day, she would put me in the movie theater, you know, for 15 or 20 minutes, and then she would come get me. And then three hours later, she would put me back in the movie theater for five or 10 minutes. So I would never see an entire film. Voilà. Et je pense que ça se voit un peu dans mon travail aujourd'hui avec euh, toutes les histoires, de, les, les multiples histoires que j'utilise avec le collage et tout. Et je tiens à dire que c'était des films de Bollywood aussi. Voilà. 
And, and I think you can see the influence of that in my work today with all the multiple stories that I'm telling and the collage. And it's important for me to say that these were Bollywood films. Et, 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 et donc cette expérience de cinéphile, enfin même pas de cinéphile, c'est-à-dire d'habitant de, de, d'une salle de cinéma, euh, je sais qu'il euh, y a une expérience, c'est dans cette salle de cinéma, le magique, que j'ai décidé d'être réalisateur. Un jour, on était en train de regarder un film de Bruce Lee et il y a un méchant qui marchait derrière Bruce Lee et qui allait attaquer Bruce Lee et il y a quelqu'un qui est sorti de la salle qui s'est levé dans la salle et qui a poignardé l'écran pour tuer le méchant. Et ce jour-là, je me suis dit que j'allais être cinéaste. So, that experience as a cinéphile, but, but actually not even really as a cinéphile, as an inhabitant of a movie theater, um, that's what led me to decide to be a director. And it happened in that specific movie theater, in the magic movie theater. It was a specific experience. One day, I was watching a Bruce Lee movie And there was a bad guy who was walking behind Bruce Lee and who was about to attack Bruce Lee. And someone in the movie theater got up and stabbed the movie screen with a knife. And that's when I decided that I wanted to be a movie director. Wow. That's amazing. That's, <clears throat> that's even better than the Lumiere myth of people <clears throat> running away from the train. <laughs> Um, thank you, Philip, for sharing that. And Olivier and Louis, uh, do you want to also tell us about your cinema education? I could say something really short because I'm not coming from uh, cinema. Um, I study science. And my first real experience of um, my relation with cinema is, was more relation with TV because we are a family of nine people. And so my, on Wednesday, when my parents when I, when I, when I were not there, when uh, they were walking, we were staying at home alone. And with my brother, I was in charge of preparing the program of the day, watching TV. So I was taking only the three channel of the TV and composing a, a kind of timeline on when you have to switch to other channel to try to stay as, as, as much as we can in front of the TV, watching the most interesting thing as possible. So I think that practice of editing have been really significant mm -hmm. for me as a first practice of cinema. And I do think that like Louis, I'm super interested in the idea of editing things. But after that, I will say that it's two other experiences that are really central for me and uh, that was really come from the world cinema. The first one is was to see on the on the cinema. I've been there with with the girls, cause until really late, I was only going to cinema to be with a uh, girls. It was the, the main reason. I have to confess it. And I, I didn't become a cinephile, but I became a producer. And so in and I saw that film called Andrei Rublev by uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. And getting outside from the cinema, and I was not interested in cinema in heart at that time. I was I was studying science. Science. I says, fuck, it's possible to do that as a film. And so it had been for me a revelation. So three hours of that, it was somebody decided to do that. And so just after that, I just have the impression that all the other films I saw were really small films, because that guy did what we can do. A kind of maximum for me, what you can do in a film. The film is long, but it's also a series of a lot of different stories in. And so for me, it's, uh, it was a revelation that the potentiality of the cinema, it was really for the world, because my mother is coming from the east of Europe and my father coming from the Caribbean. And, and on the African side, the most important uh, shock I, I had is with uh, Medondo and the film called Soleho. Because at that time, everybody in France was thinking that the most creative, experimental, modern filmmaker was uh, Jean-Luc Godard. And it was, in fact, Medondo. That was my, the last big experience for me. That at 69 and 70, that guy did that film called Soleil O, shoot with African people. And it was incredibly creative. And all the end of the film, the last scene of the film, is only the main characters shouting, shouting oh, yeah. in front of, he's screaming in front of images of the leaders of the Black Revolutions. And it's incredible to do that in cinema. And as I had a, a, another experience more than 10 years before, with uh, 15 years before with Starkovsky, after that, when I saw Medondo, is it possible to do that as a film? So at that moment, I really decided 
to work in cinema because that two potentiality was so strong. And so, yeah. yeah, I'm still trying to do something like that with Louis and other people. Louis, did you want to uh, also add something? You're muted, by the way. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I just went. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I was just, yeah, I mean, I grew up, actually, I was lucky enough to grow um, up in a cinephilic, or lucky enough, I don't know if that's lucky is the right word, but I grew up in a cinephilic environment in many respects. My, both my parents, I know it's cinephiles, but they were very interested in cinema. And, um, but I grew up in England, so I, I, was, I was unlucky enough to grow up in England in some respects. Because especially in the countryside in England, you have a very bad culture of cinema. There's not, like nothing. But I had a video shop around the corner from my house called Video Plus. And I think I watched every single videotape in that entire shop. I used to watch everything. So in England, we had this sort of distribution arm called Artificial Eye. I think that was English or maybe American. So from them, I kind of discovered everything, you know, of what they called world cinema. And of course, for me at that time, uh, when I was young, I thought Hollywood was trash. And I thought the world cinema was where it was at. So I was watching like, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'd be watching old stuff mostly. So I'd be watching things like Jean Renoir or uh, Eisenstein or, I don't know, Ingmar Bergman, this kind of classical European things. Then I got a bit older and I used to go to the cinema. My parents, you said to me, you can do what you like in the week, but every Monday you have to be at the cinema at 6 p.m. That was their deals. Like you can go skateboarding, see your friends, but you have to be at the cinema at 6 p.m. every Monday because it was cheap on Mondays. It was half price tickets at this cinema, which in France you call like, a, in England we haven't really got a word for it, but it's like a cinema d'art, ASA, like a art house cinema, that's the word. And it was called Cinema City. And there I watched the films of like Zhao Shanka, Nuri Bilgicilan, I, I first saw Abbas Kiristami, but like the films were new being released, you know? And I saw Abbas Kiristami, it just, I couldn't, my brain couldn't deal with it as a sort of 16 year old, it's just collapsed. And then, uh, but then it wasn't until I went to university that I actually discovered English cinema. And I went to England, uh, to London, I mean, to study cinema. And there, I suddenly realized that England actually did have an extremely rich cinema culture. And I was introduced to the work of, well, my teacher was William Rabin, who's one of, I think, the most important British filmmakers still alive today. I was int introduced to the work of Peter Watkins, to the work of, uh, to, of Annabel Nickerson, Liz Rhodes, uh, Tina Keane, um, all the experimental filmmakers coming out of the London Filmmakers Cooperative. And then also more importantly, which is then kind of how I became friends with Olivier, was through the work of the Black Audio Film Collective um, from John Acumfra and, and the group. And I was introduced to them through the work of uh, Angelica Segar and um, Kojo Eshen, who formed the Otolith Group. And the Otolith Group were uh, proposed for the Turner Prize in, I can't remember exactly which year, 2009, I think, 2000, yeah, 9, 2010. And for their exhibition at the Turner Prize, they made this round table with a huge screen at the back and they were doing screenings and they would invite people to come and, and it was this sort of cinephilic meeting of, and, and that, events like that, I think, really formed me in terms of later trying to think about how can we make films like round table discussions, you know, for example, uh, how can we make films that incorporate collective? So I think in London, I was introduced to the idea of um, the history and richness of film collectives. Yeah. Um, I'll ask just one more question before we take a couple audience questions, but I did want to return to the question of translation and language, maybe not in a literal way, but thinking about, film language and form. Um, all of your films in different ways are drawing upon really specific histories, whether cultural or formal, um, and kind of melding them with, I think, a more eclectic range of references. So uh, maybe I'll start with Philip here. Uh, Philip, of course, your film is drawing on the tradition of the griot, but then you also have sort of a Shehrzad uh, side to the story and there's also a strong genre element which now that you've named Bollywood as one of your formative inspirations it just clicks into place really well um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about straddling you know local and sort of more international forms in your film. 
Oui. Euh, là aussi, je vais demander à Nicolas de m'aider. J'y vais. Aussi, comme ça, on travaille ensemble. Merci. Euh, en fait, euh, euh, aujourd'hui, euh, par rapport à ce qu'Olivier disait tout à l'heure, j'aurais aimé réagir dessus. Euh, si on filme dans nos... déjà de filmer en Afrique ou de filmer dans des territoires où il y a peu de cinéma, c'est un engagement politique. So I, I'd like to start by reacting to what Olivier was saying earlier, which is that if you're going to film in Africa or in territories where there's relatively little cinema, that is already a political commitment. Oui, ça, ça, ça veut dire que déjà, effectivement, au lieu de pousser le réel, d'écarter le réel de ces pays-là, de nos pays, ça veut dire qu'on a envie de travailler avec ce réel, qu'on a envie de le mettre au centre de nos films. What it means is that instead of pushing the reality of our countries aside, it means that you want to work with that reality and you want to put it in the center of your films. Et, et, et en même temps, euh, en tant que cinéaste en Côte d'Ivoire, ben, il y a beaucoup d'attentes parce qu'il y a peu de films, parce qu'il y a une image, qui est, il y a une image de l'Afrique qui, qui est très mauvaise, qui est très dégradée. Et donc, on a une responsabilité qui est, qui est décuplée par rapport aux autres réalisateurs. At the same time, as a filmmaker in Ivory Coast, You have very high expectations that are put in you because Africa has such a bad image. It has such a degraded image. So we have a huge responsibility that others don't necessarily have. Voilà. Mais personnellement, quand je travaille sur un film, euh, je, 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 pour moi, le, le cinéma, c'est un langage. Euh, J'ai une formation de linguiste au départ et c'est un langage il n'y a pas de langage euh, africain, il n'y a pas de langage euh, américain, il n'y a pas de langage asiatique. Il y a une réalité, il y a une, il y a une perception différente. Mais le langage cinématographique, quand je fais un film, il est en même temps local et il est en même temps international parce qu'il il, il, s'adresse euh, au, au, au pays du cinéma, en fait. Personally. When I make a film, for me, cinema is a language. My background originally was as a linguist. That's what I studied at the beginning. So as I see it, there's no African language. There's no American language. There's no Asian language. There are different realities, different perceptions, but film language makes, when I make a film, it makes it local, And international. What there is actually is a country of cinema. Voilà. Mais, mais, mais pour répondre plus directement à votre question, aujourd'hui, pour moi, mon objectif, c'est de faire des films venant de Côte d'Ivoire qui s'adressent à la Côte d'Ivoire et à une audience internationale et qui racontent des histoires à partir de la vision ivoirienne, à partir de notre culture. But to answer your question more directly, my objective today is to make films in Ivory Coast for the Ivory Coast and for an international audience, films that tell stories that come from our vision, our culture. Voilà, et notre culture, en fait, c'est une culture qui ne fait pas vraiment de différence entre le visible et l'invisible, entre le réalisme et le magique entre les morts et les vivants, voilà, et c'est dans cette perception-là que j'ai écrit et que j'ai filmé La Nuit des Rois. In our culture, we don't really make a difference between the visible and the invisible, realism and magic, the dead and the alive, and that's the perception in which I made The Night of Kings in. Thank you, Philip. And um, maybe I'll take this question to Chaitanya now, and I'm just going to include sort of a few audience questions that have come up that are sort of relevant here. Um, you know, your film is very much rooted in the subculture of Hindustani classical music, particularly in Mumbai. Um, and it still is like a very universal story. The appeal of the story is sort of to anyone who's experienced artistic aspiration. And There's a lot of 
questions here about your style, like how you arrived at your particular long take style to tell that uh, story. And also people have questions about whether you're thinking about what translates to Indian audiences, what which are uh, fed more on mainstream cinema, what translates to Western audiences where, you know, your films are being sort of shown at these festivals. So I'm kind of uh, clubbing all of that in a big question for you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, where, where do I start? <laughs> uh, no, I, like, I completely agree with Philip when he says that cinema in itself is a universal language. And I also agree with Dea that for me, uh, when it comes to like a literal language of the film, it's a, it's a texture, you know, it's, it's as much an aesthetic choice uh, as a narrative choice. And yes, it's not always informed by what the market wants. Like even for an Indian film, Hindi would be the most obvious choice to make a film in because then it reaches a lot more people in India. But, you know, for me, it would be strange if people uh, who are Maharashtrians, you know, where Mumbai is, if, if they spoke uh, uh, in Hindi and similarly, you know, I sometimes find it strange when I see Indians, uh, you know, talking uh, in English on screen, even though uh, English is the administrative language of the country. Uh, and we have like, I don't know how many hundreds of languages and thousands of, of, of dialects. When it comes to the style, which is again, more part of a, a film language question, you know, um, I think that's something that's constantly evolving, you know, and that's not uh, like my choices are not informed by, oh, whether this will speak to a mainstream Indian audience or whether this will speak to an international audience, uh, because that's coming from my own influences, my own uh, preferences, and also what the narrative needs. Uh, because, uh, you know, like my first film was entirely static shots. The Disciple has a lot more movement uh, compared uh, to, to court. Um, and do I think about it as to what will translate for an international audience or an Indian audience? I don't. Like I said, I make the film with my intuition, with my sensibility, and then I hope for an audience. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly big on simplifying themes or, or explaining uh, the cultural nuances or the invisible complexities or even the politics of language. Uh, you know, or the caste politics that, you know, uh, you can't escape uh, in India, like simplifying it for an international audience, because one also has uh, some faith in the intuitive power of a, of a viewer, you know, uh, you would, you won't want to grant some intelligence to the viewers and would allow, you know, you want to allow them to intuit certain things. And I think that's also the beauty of cinema from different parts of the world where uh, it kind of uh, forces you to want to know more about uh, these subtexts, to want to know more about these cultures, and to you know uh, want to understand what's beyond the screen, in a way. I, I hope I answered some of your questions at least. I that. think yeah, I that was really masterful. <laughs> um, I just before we move on, I do want to uh, ask if you could comment on your choices in portraying Indian classical music, because there's a lot of questions about that. Um, you know, how that, what kind of thought process was behind how the music is such a sort of enveloping part of that film, so. Right. Uh, for me, it comes down to like stories and to, you know, different characters and worlds that I find fascinating. Like, I didn't know anything about Indian classical music. You know, it was as alien to me as it would be to an international audience. Uh, and my entry point were the stories and the anecdotes and just its rich history of like 800 years old, you know, it being 800 years old and, uh, you know, the, the nuances and the complexities uh, with my first film, it was the Indian judiciary. And again, it's something similar to what Philip said that it's a marriage of something internal and something completely foreign and, and external. Like the themes that I'm exploring in the film are very personal to me. But this world of music was something completely new and exciting. And I like doing research. I like knowing more about different worlds. I like, uh, you know, uh, being obsessed with things that are a part of my society, my culture, but that I don't know much about. It's a way for me to shake off my insular upbringing and educate myself and get to know not just my society and my culture better, but to, you know, understand other societies and other cultures better because I, you know, deeply believe that 
at the end of it all, uh, the human condition, you know, and the problems of existence and the problems of, and the issues of uh, self-expression of power dynamics, like Luis mentioned, they are pretty universal, you know. Thank you. And they are, um, there's a lot of audience questions to you as well about this theme of balancing the personal uh, with the universal. Um, someone actually asked about your many international collaborators, uh, you know, how all of their influences came together into this personal film that is so rooted in the place from which you come. Well, I, I guess like I, uh, I am very much interested in examining the human condition. And uh, as a woman, obviously, I am interested to tell the, uh, the stories of women. And uh, I think that uh, when I, it, it's important for me to look at the places where I grew up and to, to go back where I grew up, because I need to find the connection. I need to find um, my identity in a way. You know, because it doesn't matter how I will evolve and what will be my future. I think we all carry our past with us and how we all grew up and what were our influences as uh, humans. And that was for me the starting point to really influence this, um, uh, to really examine this condition of a human, um, of a woman who stands in the moment when she is looking outside of her comfort zone or the, of something familiar her family and she wants something which is outside because she cannot fit in anymore. But she doesn't know what's that. Well, she doesn't know what is this new and it's a painful and it's a, it's, it's a tragic story. At the end. And I think uh, there is of course my personal connection with, with it because I do, um, I do know these women and I come from this place and I went through the journey uh, to become a director and I'm sure that many other women from this place went on their journeys and uh, to uh, face the unknown or to take a step forward. And, um, but also to look back maybe from the perspective of New York or Paris or to study abroad, I could start to connect that those stories with all uh, like was just the universal human experiences and human condition. And I just understood that there is, there is a connection between all of us. And that's maybe what cinema does at the end. It does um, speak in the universal language and maybe like talking about the Tarkovsky films. Like I was, for example, in New York, always going to Tarkovsky retrospectives and I was blown away with this fact that sometimes even the subtitles would not work, but people were just mesmerized by cinema that was like on the screen. And uh, my international team of collaborators, um, I think that's very important because in Georgia, we, I, I want to also mention, we don't really have film industry and we don't really have um, that many film theaters. Maybe we have five film theaters in the entire country. I might be wrong, or maybe it's a bit more, like maybe seven. So we don't really have an industry and the new generation of the film directors, we're looking out. We do need the collaborators who can come to Georgia to uh, work with us and it's also something which I personally need. I do need this connection with people outside of Georgia as well, because I am interested to look at the experiences through their eyes. And it's, it's very important for me. So I, I had a great team, by the way, and I want to thank everyone who worked with me on this film. And just so everyone knows, um, your Matthew Tapernier was one of your collaborators, uh, mm -hmm. who was the editor of Son of Saul? No, yeah. I, right. right. And also Nicholas Jaw, right, who did the music, so. Um, and they were... all were in Georgia, and I think it was extremely important for me that they were in Georgia physically, and they could go to the locations, and they could see what Georgia really is, and to go to these places with me, and to physically experience to be there, and to live with the people on the location. So that was, I'm very grateful for all of them. And Olivia and Louis, um, your film, like I said, I wanted to return to the question of translation, but maybe in a different way, of course, the act of translation is central to your film, but you're also uh, cross-pollinating between different forms. So, you know, you have rap, uh, you have sort of more experimental film form, you have singing and drumming and chanting, all of this coming together in this film. And 
wondering if you could talk about that, uh, the hybridity of the film. I mean, that also yes, came from us working with the group of people that we were, you know, with the guys from Haiti, actually, because quite a lot of the propositions of scenes in the film came from us. I mean, I think the best way to explain it, actually, was, for example, when we first went to Haiti, Olivier and I together, we actually set up this workshop for two weeks, um, which was the first time that we met the majority of people we ended up working with. Because I had been to Haiti before, and I had met up with um, the poet and writer, slam artist, Rossi Jacques Casimir, and uh, we had started a conversation. He actually did, like, um, uh, we, he actually gave me a recording of one of his slam poems that then I used in a film. That's how we began our collaboration, really, in that first instance. And then it was Rossi that suggested the group of people that we would work with for this translation workshops. And uh, when we arrived, Olivier and I, actually, it's the first time we met basically everybody, and we spent two weeks together uh, translating the play by Edouard Glissant with the idea of eventually putting it on as a, as a production. And uh, at that time, we started trying out some scenes from the play. And we started filming some things, just as like, almost like screen tests in a way to see how stuff could start to work out. And then when I went back later to actually start the production, I spent like, what, two, three months, I think, in Haiti with the group, still just kind of spending time, getting to know each other, walking around. Then Olivier came and we actually spent some time putting on the play. And then we went back later to then film the rest of the film in August, 2018. But actually in that sort of first period of shooting in 2017, quite a lot of the things that we developed in terms of how we would, like, like the scene with the two, with Rossi Jacques Casimir, Leonard Jean-Baptiste, and they're both sitting in front of a painting of a mural of yeah. the, one of the revolutionary heroes, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. And they're wrapping a scene from Edouard Glissant's play, of Toussaint. And that actually came about because we were in the session months prior in the translation workshops. And I think they were both there and they started like trying out some different ways of, you know, pronouncing certain phrases. And Olivier and I sort of noticed that actually it was quite rhythmic. Leonard and Rossi have both experience in doing slam poetry and rap. And um, we actually started to realize that that sequence that they were studying from the play had this certain uh, interesting rhythm uh, to it that could be perhaps proposed as um, like a rap or slam battle. It's an argument as well between, in the play itself, it's an argument between Jean-Jacques Dessalines on one hand and the secretary of Toussaint Louverture called Granville. So for them, it's almost felt natural as well, because in slam, part of slam poetry or rap anyway, is about doing these battles. So that was a proposition that came from that, you know, workshop and this kind of long winded development process that we had to make the film. And then, you know, I don't know. I mean, just, I think a lot of the hybridity actually came from the fact also that we decided to, so I originally wanted to make a film about um, people rehearsing a play, which was me somewhat being influenced by the work of Jacques Rivette, who's made various films for people rehearsing plays. Um, you know, Paris Nous Appartient, also Out One. Uh, I can't think of any other examples right now off the top of my head, but I was particularly influenced by Out One, which is a, this 13 hour film that Jacques Rivette made in 1971. And, um, and I wanted just to film people doing a play, like a sort of documentary way of filming the process of fictionalizing something. And actually Olivier said to me, but isn't it sort of a waste of time for the people involved that we just film them rehearsing? Like maybe it's interesting for them to actually do the play. Again, constantly thinking about the context of the, the, the specificities of the place we're shooting in, mm. which for them in Haiti, it's important to feel, you know, to be inserted within the, the art scene in Port-au-Prince, not just to have that thing extracted and taken to Europe where it's recognized because it gets shown in. Berlin Ali or whatever, but also to do something actually in Port-au-Prince in Haiti. So we did the play and the development of the play, because Olivier is not a theatre director, but he ended up directing that play by Edouard Glissant. And I for sure was quite surprised that suddenly Olivier pulled out of his hat of tricks, whatever. He's like, oh, this is my theatre director hat. And he just like 
you know. So that was impressive. And that, I think, brought in the possibility for hybridity because, you know, it was like, and also because we never really had a script. We had one, but we never really used it. Uh, we wrote parts of the script actually in the hotel room when we were there shooting. And actually, I think a better word than script is the word scenario. In French, the old fashioned term, you'd say scenario. And actually scenario is a great word because it means like, it's like about a scene, a place, a space, you know? We would create scenarios and they were adaptable and malleable and they would change. So in the end, really, the film was just made up as we went along. In some respect, I think Olivia would argue against that, but I think a lot of it is made up as we went along. No, I, I won't argue against that, but I would just to want to precise that the privilege that we have with the film is that the producer, which is me in that case, is a kind of mad person, a mad person able to do what producers don't do normally, that you accept to all improvisation. And I was in some point more, uh, more mad than Louis at some point says, yeah, Olivia, what about the film? Are we making a film? He said, I don't know, let's keep on, which is exactly the opposite of the normal attitude of a producer. So it's just to say, let's keep on something happening. I'm sure that something will come out from that. And so we accept also to at some point to lose the idea of the film that is, I've been reconstituted with constitute in time, you know? It's a kind of moment of uh, decomposition of the idea of the film and a, another a recomposition later. And so we are, we've accept both the, that, that process, which is quite difficult for uh, the filmmaker, also me as a producer, but involved also in a creative way. But we all also talk about creative producer. In that way, it's, a, it's more than being creative producer. You are really inside the matter of the reality. But just, to come back to two points, I would say that um, at some point, Ouverture is really uh, a film about attention. Because, of course, we wrote the film along the process of making it, and I agree with what Louis says, but I will say the most, of the, the most important part of the matter of the film is based on what I would, would call side conversation, you know? you are in IT and people are always talking about uh, different kind of feelings they have, about the play, about what they are doing, about, and the more we are able to understand Asian Creole, the more we are able to say, hey, I'm sorry, we were in the bus and you were talking about that and that. Yes, it's true. Is it possible to, to do it again when I show this? Yeah, but we are talking about the production, about the problem. Yeah, so you're going to talk about your position as a black person, as a woman, as somebody involved in, and in the fact that there is no a lot of women in the play of Glissant, and it's a problem for you as a black woman that not to be represented in the film. Yes, but it's just a comment I did. Yes, but I, we like that comment. So let's shoot that comment about what we are doing. And so the process of reinvesting uh, all the matter on the sides, you know, in the center is really, I think, the, the, the global drawings of the film. So the side become the film. There is no center. So the film, there is no something would be the scene of the film. The scene is always on the border of the film. So we're navigating on that border, which is, I will say, to, to take something about what Philip says about the fact there is a kind of universal languages of cinema. In some way, you said two things, and I, I more agree with the second one that there is a lot of different perspectives that we try to express. So, okay, it's universal languages, but in some way I don't really understand what it means to be universal, except if we consider that it's composed by a lot of different perspectives altogether. So we were looking from a local perspective in a country which is not our country. So you need at that point to have a lot of attention to let the local perspective coming, because we don't know we didn't know before making the film what could be a Haitian or more Caribbean perspective on cinema. And I do think that Ouverture is a good example of what could be a kind of uh, Caribbean perspective on cinema. That means there is a kind of cacophonic dimensions too, because everybody is talking at the same time in Haiti, like in all the Caribbean contexts, and it's not possible to imagine how people can understand each other, talking all at the same moment. So all that aspect of the life in Haiti became the kind of perspective 
own cinema. It's the film, but it's also a perspective of something. And just to finish, to say something really close to what Philippe says, of course, the, the ensemble we create called The Living and the Dead, just to express that we are working with the living and with the dead in the film, all together on the same level. And I will say in the certain way, the Caribbean perspective you create, it's a kind of hallucination. Normally there is really that kind of idea, you know, of the reason of the Western and modern reason that was the base of the, mod of the, of the Western modernity about the Caribbeans. And so in front of that reason, a cinema of reason, we create that cinema of hallucination, which is a kind of response of, you, you have the obligation to have some hallucination in that kind of context, otherwise you can live. If you got a reason, you begin mad because the situation is super hard. So the hallucination is a kind of politic of becoming, going to another level. And it's a really political statement. It's not living from the, not level of reality, it's level for people. And I do think we create also that space that is livable for all the people. We live in the film in a certain way. It's a kind of friendship in the film. I think that's a pretty good note uh, to end the conversation on. We're a little over the hour mark, but it was such a rich discussion that, you know, it's hard to put a stop to it. But before we say bye to everyone, I just... Um, what, you know, want to ask if anyone has any last thoughts to share or any questions for each other or anything at all. Okay. I didn't watch all the film at the moment, but I, well, I would like to see all of them really now. I will do it this evening for sure. Watched all the films. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I found them on TV. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you all so much for making time for this discussion. Thank you thank so you. much for your really incredible contributions and for, you know, changing the contours of world cinema. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope you keep doing that. And thank you um, for all our attendees uh, for tuning in. We have one more week or less than a week of the New York Film <laughs> Festival left. So, you know, keep coming back for more talks, keep uh, watching films on our platform, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci, Nicolas. Uh, yeah. Rien, merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye.